Hello everyone, and welcome to this series of videos on extinction. I'm recording this today from an autumnal and fairly overcast Manchester. I guess it feels kind of fitting um, that the seasons are changing and I'm teaching you about extinction. And this is video number one of five on this topic. And in this video, we're going to look at the extinction of species, of individual species. This is the most kind of granular level at which we can look at extinction before in the, uh, the next videos, we take this up to a kind of a bigger level and look at bigger scale patterns. When it comes to looking at something like the idea of extinction, I think it always makes sense to first start by thinking about the history of this idea. So extinction was not thought to exist throughout most early scientific endeavors. We can in many ways think of uh, topics like paleontology and geology being products on the Enlightenment, this period where people um, looked towards methodological naturalism to understand um, the world around them. And when the Enlightenment was occurring and geology as a topic was being developed, most scientists in Europe and America up until this point had believed that the natural world was complete, full and perfect and had been created by a creator of some form. Um, which creator that is depends obviously on the worldview in, um, of those people. But within that worldview, typically the thought was that no species ever became extinct because such an event would destroy the perfection of nature. The uh, tides on this kind of view of the world started to change with the work of this gentleman shown on the left here, Georges Cuvier, who was born in 1769 in Paris. He was ultimately responsible for establishing the idea of extinction. He was a French naturalist and zoologist, and during his life, the existence of extinct species was frequently questioned due to this worldview I've just kind of um, I've just talked about. However, he demonstrated through the power of comparative anatomy that this must have occurred. So for example, he looked at elephant anatomy and he showed that the African and Indian elephants um, that were, are alive today are different species. This bottom image here in the middle is the jaw of a living Indian elephant. But he also showed that mammoths and the jaw of a mammoth is shown on the top here, and some of the teeth of a mammoth are shown here on the right hand side. He, this gentleman, Georges Cuvier, demonstrated through comparative anatomy that the mammoths, the fossils we have from Europe and Siberia, are different from either of these living elephant species. He published uh, study after study demonstrating that in the past, large mammals existed that resemble uh, organisms that are no longer alive today. And through this series of studies, like the one on the mastodon here, he, or I should say mammoth, I suppose, he demonstrated that species must have a finite time and then they must go extinct. I guess it's of note, and I should mention here, that he suggested extinctions could be due to periodic catastrophic floods. He was a key proponent of an idea called cat cat catastrophism. Oh my goodness, that was difficult to pronounce. Um, as opposed to uniformitarianism. Strangely, that wasn't difficult to pronounce. Who knows what that's all about? Um, and that's that idea of these kind of periodic catastrophes, to an extent we don't recognise today. We think that uniformitarianism is the norm. So he was right in some ways and wrong in others, as we all are. So all is good. So that's kind of seeded the thought of extinction of a species being something that occurs and has allowed us to study it. So the idea that a single species can go extinct was accepted by many people relatively rapidly. We now know that extinction happens all the time. Species have a natural duration of everything, anything from a few thousand years to a few million. And so they live for a time and then they disappear. An example of this is the dodo shown on the left hand side here. So this is an extinction in mem living memory, which was driven by human hunting. So that's the impact of, um, of humankind through hunting on the island of Mauritius. This is a species that has gone extinct really relatively recently. What this means, this process, the fact that this is happening all the time, 
What this means is that there is a pattern of normal or background extinction that happens without any broad scale cause. Often this starts um, as we see it through a process called extirpation. So this is localized extinction and it occurs in an area, often an area that we're looking at before the complete extinction of a species. Basically what this is telling us is that extinction rarely happens globally in one place. Normally ranges contract and eventually a species will have a stronghold that will die out. A really nice example of this is the Rocky Mountain locust that's shown on the right hand side here, this little doodle dudette here. So this is an orthopteran insect, the locust. And this is famous because it coalesced into swarms which were really, really big. Some of the um, the range of the different swarms of Rocky Mountain locusts are shown in different colours on this map at the top here. These were massive, massive swarms of insects that consumed up to 50 tonnes of ve vegetation a day. In 1875, this species reached what we could term a biological crescendo. I found that in a paper that I read and I really liked it. Um, this was an aggregation of 3.5 trillion insects that formed a 110 mile wide, 1800 mile long aerial river of flying insects that eclipsed the sun for five days as it passed overhead. So we're talking about a really big, really successful swarm species in this particular case in 1875. However, these um, swarms occurred between, were as a result of um, drought driven upsurges and between these upsurges the locusts retreated into the mountains which was their home range the fertile montane river valleys so this was a tight what we would term an ecological bottleneck they lived in a very very specific environment when they weren't swarming these were also lands that the pioneers humans were converting to agricultural production around this time this activity decimated their breeding ground and so by 1902 the rocky mountain locust this little creature here had gone extinct a mere 27 years after there were 3.5 trillion individuals creating a swarm so these can change very very quickly and this shows how um, species actually have these ranges that um, we need to consider when we're thinking about extinction so nowadays, how do we define extinction? Well, I've put a definition on the slide for you here. So extinction is the irreversible condition of a species or other group of organisms of having no living representatives in the wild, which follows the death of the last surviving individuals of that species or group. It may occur at a global or local level. Um, so more broadly, we can say that a species is functionally extinct, but we can't bring it back when all interbreeding populations have been eliminated or a population is small enough that it is no longer viable and how big that is depends on the group that we're looking at. An example, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say here, is Sudan. This is the uh, last male northern white rhino dying, being comforted by his keeper, Joseph Okira, one of the people looking after him. And this is the moment that this species went extinct in March 2018. This is an extinction that's caused by human activity once more. This is poaching since the 1970s have led to the extinction of this group of which Sudan was the last member. If we think about this on a broader scale, we estimate that between 5 and 50 billion species have lived on Earth since I, the origin of life. We know that there are between 5 and 15 million species alive today. That's a, a thing we can ask, estimate. This means that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. So this means that uh, extinction um, is a very, very important process. In the geological record, we think that species are lost either through perturbations imposed on them from outside, so things like environmental change, we could call those extrinsic causes. Extrinsic means coming from outside. And those extrinsic causes may be biotic, so they may be related to other organisms, such as predators, say, or they could be abiotic. Alternatively, extinctions may occur because of evolutionary changes that occur 
to uh, a species members because of their own biology, say their generation time or some other aspect of their, their life cycle, such as their reproductive cycle. Those species, those extinctions, sorry, I should say that are caused by such things, we refer to as being driven by intrinsic causes. They are intrinsic to the individuals at play. Obviously, these two can and always do interact when it comes to species. So when we look at this and we say you've got these two causes, we can then start thinking about what may be increasing our risk of extinction of species. So we can note that extinction isn't thought to be random. OK, so if we look across the tree of life, actually extinction typically is concentrated in some parts of the tree as opposed to others. And obviously, that may shift through time. Um, but I find it's a useful kind of way to think about this, to say that there are intrinsic factors that detect extinction risk. So those include body size. There is some evidence that larger body sizes in mammals for example, or extremes of body size more generally, increase extinction risk. Specialization, for example, um, towards a narrow temperature range, say, or a specific prey item or diet, increases the risk of extinction, as opposed to generalism. A really good example of specialism is this panda here. It's very, very cute, but it's really, really specialized. It's, it's evolved survive of eating bamboo. This is a very, very restrictive diet, and that's what makes it at risk of extinction. Reproductive range is also, sorry, reproductive range, reproductive rate, I should say, is also um, a very strong factor on um, extinction risk. Low rates of reproduction increase risk. They are linked to, um, for example, body size and population density. Again, our panda is a good example of that. A uh, range side, uh, range size, I should say, sorry, is a very good um, kind of uh, predictor of risk of extinction. This um, image on the right shows us patterns of species distribution um, and their relative range sizes shown uh, in uh, these yellow colors being smaller ranges. And on the bottom here, we can see um, threatened species. Again, yellow is being more threatened than blues. And we can see that in areas where we have uh, restricted species ranges, we also have increased risk of extinction. It's a really nice example of an intrinsic um, risk factor when it, with extinction. And of course, before I get onto extrinsic courses, I wanted to highlight that extinctions sometimes go together. The extinction of one species is likely to have a knock-on effect on its ecosystem. And that knock-on effect probably includes further extinctions. It's worth at this point noting the ecological concept of a keystone species. This is a species which has a disproportionately large effect on an ecosystem relative to its abundance. And the knock-on effect for the extinction of keystone species is likely to be particularly large. An extreme form of um, an interaction on species is co-extinction. If your prey item, say, goes extinct, or your pollinator, if you're a plant, goes extinct, or the thing you parasitize, if you're, if you're a parasite, goes extinct, that is a bad time for your species, and it's highly likely to lead to your own extinction. I think avocados are a really neat example of this. So if you think about an avocado, what is the point of this giant seed? If we consider seeds a thing um, for spreading kind of, uh, baby plants around, things have to eat them. This seed is so large that nothing that's alive today could possibly eat that and then poop it out somewhere else to, to serve the purpose that's, that that seed has clearly evolved for. However, it's been suggested in this case, and I put a nice paper on this slide for you here, that actually this avocados kind of make sense in terms of the recent geological past. It's been suggested that ground sloths and other Pleistocene megafauna, really, really big mammals from the recent past, were responsible for spreading these massive seeds because they had large mouths, could swallow them, and large guts. Now those animals are extinct. If it weren't for the fact that humans really like good old fashioned smashed avocado on toast or similar, obviously that's more recent than our cultivation of avocados. But if it wasn't for us cultivating avocados, they would be at serious risk of extinction. 
and because their seed dispersal mechanisms are now extinct, because those species that disperse their seeds are extinct, they're at risk of co-extinction. So that's one example of how the extinction of a species can affect others. So moving on beyond ex intrinsic causes, we can also think about extrinsic causes that cause extinction. These extrinsic causes can include things such as habitat degradation or destruction. When a habitat becomes incapable of supporting its native species, this can lead to their extinction. Today, this is driven to a large extent by human activity. We change habitats full scale to build our cities, and that is a really bad time for the species that used to live there. Things like predators and disease, um, so pathogens, evolve. And if a species does not keep up with that threat from predation or disease, uh, it may ultimately go extinct. It will threaten its survival. Climate change is a thing that has happened throughout Earth history, not at the rate that it's happening today, but it has always happened. Um, and it always changes the range of organisms, and that in turn can drive species to extinction. Invasive species i.e. if a species that is not native to a specific location is introduced by either natural causes such as plate tectonics or by anthropogenic, so human-driven causes, invasive species can lead to the extinction of native species to an area. Examples are shown on this slide that are creatures that are invasive to the United Kingdom where I'm recording this. So for example, the Asian hornet shown on the left here was first identified in the UK in 2016. It's a voracious predator of honeybees and other insects, and so this is a worry. And if you want to see the absolute latest on this, here's a review on the success of our strategies trying to tackle this particular species and how um, we're doing and how its spread is being slowed by our activities. Another slightly surprising example is the Eastern Grey Squirrel shown on the right here. This was deliberately released into the wild in Great Britain in 1876. Uh, and this species carries a pox virus to which our native red squirrels are very susceptible. As a result, red squirrels have been wiped out along across large swathes of Great Britain. Only a few remain in England and Wales for, in particular. And ironically, in parts of the UK, a melan melanistic, so a black form of squirrel, um, is now driving the grey form out from areas such as Cambridgeshire in the southeast of the UK. And today, more and more of these extrinsic factors are driven by human activity. We'll cover this more in one of the later videos. But that right there is the extinction of species. And in our next video, video number two, we're going to look at the basics of mass extinctions. So I will see you there very, very shortly. See ya.